Welcome to the Wing Chun Discussion Podcast with your hosts, Dane and Vito, interviewing Wing Chun practitioners and instructors, expanding the world of Wing Chun. Welcome to the Wing Chun Discussion Podcast. I'm Vito. And I'm Dane. And today we have Andrew Nierlich from Sydney, Australia. Andrew, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Good to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. Nice to meet you, uh, Andrew. Thank you, Vito. Yeah, so um, yeah, so we're actually uh, pretty far apart in our time zone. It's about uh, it's in the evening here, and uh, Andrew, I understand you're you're getting your day started where you're at. That's right. It's about quarter past nine in the morning. Cool. So uh, yeah, so we're happy that uh, you're here with us, and uh, tell us a little bit about um, you know where you're from and and uh, a little bit of your history. Okay, I live in Sydney, Australia. Uh, I've spent most of my life here. I did live in England as a child for about five years, and I lived in the city of Canberra for close to two years in my early 20s. The rest of the time I've been here in Sydney, which is an international city, and it's got most of what most people would need, I think. Yeah, so it's a pretty big city. Yes. Oh, cool. What what are you? Uh, what are the differences um, from where you were living in the UK to here? Um, my wife and I went back to the UK a few years ago. Um, the climate is much colder. Um, we found uh, the streets are a lot narrower and. Um, People spend a lot more time indoors. Um, mm-hmm. I much prefer a warmer climate myself, which Sydney provides. Yeah, the climate there is uh, cloudy and, and rainy most of the time, right? In like Sydney. in uh, in the UK. Oh, in the UK, yes, definitely. Yes, yeah. we got a lot more sun here. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So you moved to Sydney at what age? Um, okay, I was born in Adelaide, um, South Australia. I lived there for a year and a half. Uh, my parents and I moved to England uh, when I was about a year and a half old. Lived there till I was seven. We came back to Sydney. My father is an academic. Um, he's still kicking at 90 years old. I got my first job out of university in Canberra. I lived there for about 18 months and that's where I was introduced to Kung Fu and martial arts. Um, moved back to Sydney after 18 months and I've basically been living here ever since. So how did you get into Kung Fu? Okay. Um, in my first job in Canberra, I worked for the Australian Public Service. Um, and as you may know, Canberra is more or less the government capital of Australia. So there's a big, uh, big contingent of public servants there. Um, I didn't really have a firm direction for myself. Uh, I was just sort of going going along with what was expected of me. Um, a guy that worked in another department in my building was a Kung Fu instructor. His name was David Crook, one of the more gregarious people in my department. Um, got him to teach a few of us some basics of his style of Kung Fu. Um, we did What's that style? probably... I'm sorry? What style was it? What style? It was actually a synthetic style uh, called uh, Back Fu Do, which is white tiger style. Um, it's really a mix of Wing Chun, Choi Lei Foot, and um, Northern Shaolin. Um, oh, interesting. Yes, it, it was an interesting introduction 
Um, as far as stylistic purity goes, um, I was pretty much ruined from the start. Um, uh-huh. David had uh, Dan rankings in Gajiria Karate and Japanese Jiu-Jitsu before he switched to doing Kung Fu. He trained Wing Chun with William Chung on and off for a few years, um, but he trained with other other teachers of other styles too, obviously, and sort of put what he taught together for himself. I'm actually I'm thinking about those now, like those styles you said. It was Wing Chun and Trilly Foot, and uh, and Wing Chun is is. Uh, would be considered like a close range trilly foot is the opposite. I think it has like a lot of these like swinging arms and, and, uh, and yeah. kicks and stuff. The way that um, David explained his philosophy to me was that um, Wing Chun is a close in um, straight line, very direct sort of style. Um, trilly foot is full of circles and mm. is – extremely good in, well, as good as you're going to get anyway, in multi-opponent sort of situations. It um, does have a lot of techniques which were specifically designed to get around Wing Chun guards and counter um, the structure of Wing Chun, that sort of thing. And the Northern Shaolin is sort of more of a long-range, kicking, acrobatic sort of system. So that, um, yeah, with those, and it also has uh, integrated grappling system involved. If you put all those together, Mm -hmm. um, more or less whatever sort of other specialty a fighter might have, you'll have some weapons in your arsenal that um, might work to counter or nullify their approach because it is an eclectic approach. Yeah, that was, that was his philosophy. And, um, Yeah, I I thought it was a good one. Um, I learned some valuable skills from him, even in only 18 months. And he put a lot of time into me, which I really appreciate still these days. And I still correspond with him, even though we live in different cities, and I regard him as a good friend and mentor. Wow. So then where did you go from there? Uh, Okay. Um. I moved back to Sydney mainly because uh, Canberra at the time was a very difficult place uh, for an introverted single person like myself to get on. Um, I more or less stuck it out for the first year and I'm you know, thinking, gee, there's not much is happening here. I'm not making any friends and uh, everyone keeps to themselves. And I went for a holiday on the south coast of New South Wales, which is the eastern seaboard. And, yeah, I instantly made um, a whole lot of new friends and thought, well, I don't think it's me that's got the social problem. I think it's the environment. And so I moved back to Sydney because, you know, there's there's more to life to work and, you know, there's more to life than Kung Fu as well. Um, Mm -hmm. My only real regret was that I was – leaving David and his tuition in his style of Kung Fu behind. Um, I sort of bounced around looking for a decent school for probably a couple of years. Um, Had some interesting times sort of training with a William Chung student in a squat, if you understand that terminology. Uh, It's more or less... uh, a derelict house that people have moved into unofficially and they're more or less homeless, but they've got a house, if you understand what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, I get it, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah, it was all sort of pretty funky, ghetto sort of thing and, um, yeah, a lot of weird stuff went on, a lot of drug users in that area. We had one day where, you know, we training out the back and there was a heavy bag sort of in the living room as you do hanging Mm -hmm. up and uh, this guy burst in and started screaming and he started wailing away on the heavy bag and you know all the instructors sort of went inside and eventually coaxed him out on the street off to you know whatever 
savage fate destiny had in store for him. And, yeah, you'd see sort of people walking around like zombies on drugs all the time. There's oh a tap God. in the backyard and, you know, people of both sexes had come in from all the various houses around to wash, which is pretty distracting when you're trying to train and there's, yeah. a, there's a naked woman there washing herself under the tap and, you know, it's a good, no, nah, this is a bit too ghetto for us. We don't belong here. Um, my friend Michael was in the army and he moved to Queensland. So I was on my own. There was a school I'd been to, which was a Tai Chi Zingyi Bagua school, which I'd went to and wasn't that impressed with, but was the only sort of option I saw at the moment. I went there for five years. Uh, I learned some skills, but it was basically pretty basic. And the, um, the instructor was a bit of a manipulator. Uh, mm-hmm. I talk about him a bit on my blog. Um, but, yeah, that I sort of got sick of all that and gave up for a few years and went surfing. And eventually the bug hit me again. By this time, Rick Spain, who was at the time uh, William Chung's most senior student, he'd moved to Sydney and was teaching classes. I started with him in 1988, I think, and I've sort of been training with him on and off, mostly on ever since. And, yeah, that's been uh, 32-something years now. Oh, wow. I sometimes think the 90s – still, I don't know, I still think the 90s were like 10 years ago. Yeah, well, it's it's hard not to. You sort of – I saw a photo of myself on Facebook and, you know, my 50th birthday, and I'm thinking, geez, that was 15 years ago. <laughs> so that's a long time to be – so that was Wing Chun that you were you were practicing with him? Um, yes. I, I was graded to, like, the instructor level with him in 95. Um, I've been teaching sort of informally, even at the – the Jingyi Bagua school before that. Um, I got my red sash, which is like the highest level in Rick's system, in uh-huh. 2011, I think. So I basically finished the grading system in Rick's school then, which isn't to say that I'd mastered Wing Chun by any stretch, uh, mm-hmm. but I'd more or less finished the grading system. Um, in 1998, I think it was, um, Rick had a friend in Melbourne called John Will, um, who was Australia's first Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. He brought him up to the school for a seminar. Um, John's quite an inspiring and unique individual and, um, Jiu-Jitsu became part of our curriculum from then on. Um, I sort of probably ran with that a bit harder than a lot of the other people there. I um, trained with Rick for a bit, yeah, Rick and what he could bring to the table for about six years, which was a lot. Um, He was training with, um, you know, higher-ranked Jiu-Jitsu guys outside of his club as well. Um, I sort of had the discussion with him and said, look, you know, I'd like to pursue this. I want to go and train with some higher level guys, which which I did. Um, I've been with my current jiu-jitsu instructor, Anthony Lange, since 2007. Got my black belt in 2013. I'm currently a second degree black belt in jiu-jitsu. Wow. The way you're describing all this, you have a lot of experience with, uh, you know, with martial arts and it's a diverse experience too. Like, because you were talking about where you got started uh, learning, you know, multiple styles of Kung Fu. We have like a, a lot of Wing Chun and now, and now jiu-jitsu, which is um, a completely different style. Yeah, that, that's true. Um, back in 
the earlier days in my career, it was extremely hard to get information, um, you know, check instructors' backgrounds, um, all that sort of thing. So, yeah, you most students were sort of flailing around and, um, yeah, I, I sort of, yeah, I found I was going down a lot of blind alleys and taking wrong turns and stuff until I sort of hooked up with Rick Spain. Um, what can I say? I mean, these days with the internet, you know, it's you can get instant validation on anybody. Uh, you do get a lot of noise with the signal, but, um, you know, you've got this ton of information that you, at your fingertips, which you never had back in those days. All you had outside of your own circle was books and magazines, and you get mm-hmm. a magazine and you'd sort of devour that and take what you could out of that for the next month until sort of the next issue came out. And, yeah, um, yeah that Follow was... It. That was, it was a totally different game in those days. So one question I want to ask you is, um, you know, because Wing Chun has, uh, you know, a lot of the principles that uh, that they teach. And, and with your experience learning different things, I wonder what are some of the principles from Wing Chun that are important to you um, when it comes to your approach to, to martial arts? Okay. Um, well, I think in um, most styles of fighting, whatever you want to call it, you you do need um, economy of movement, if you like, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you can call it efficiency. You can call it effectiveness, but Basically, you've got to keep a reasonably tight sort of structure and, um, yeah, not not let things flap around, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, you want to keep it tight. You want to... Yeah. Uh, one of uh, William Chung's principles is, you know, you're watching the lead elbow and trying to control the lead elbow in jiu-jitsu. Uh, we talk about the leading edge. Um, you know, if you're on the floor, it might be a leg. It might be the person's hand that they're sticking out to grab you. Uh, it might be their neck or whatever, but you controlling that and or attacking that. The um, leading edge, like uh, yeah. whatever is to yeah. you that belongs to the opponent? Um, yeah, whatever, whatever's closest, that's sort of what you deal with. Uh-huh. Um, in William Chung's system, um, you watch the elbows and knees ostensibly because they generally tend to move more slowly than the extremities like the fist or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. You've got a better chance of, of catching them without getting hit yourself. Um, and in jiu-jitsu, a lot of ways, it's the elbows and the knees that you're attacking, along, of course, with the you know, throat, head, neck, whatever. Um, so controlling the elbows and knees is is a good thing to do. Um, what else have we got here? Oh, yeah. Um, structure. Structure. Um, structure seems to be a large buzzword in uh, Wing Chun these days, and I certainly mm-hmm. agree it's important. Uh, as is sensitivity, chi sao, that sort of thing. I personally, these days, I see, you know, the um, the formal sort of chi sao exercises more as a an exercise in structure and elbow positioning rather than a sensitivity drill. Oh, um, really? Yeah. I, you know, if you don't have the structure right, it doesn't matter how sensitive you are, you're still going to get hit because of reaction time, etc. cetera. You know, if you don't, if, if you've got the fuxiao and your elbow sticking out, 
Um, they can react faster than you. They can hit you before you can stop them with a jutsu or whatever. But if your elbow's mm-hmm. in, you've got that barrier there. And they've got to move that elbow out of the way so that they be able, they'll be able to strike you, but you can feel that and so you know what's coming. So, you know, sensitivity is there, but I think the, the structure is important as well. If you don't have that, then the, the whole thing falls apart. That's interesting. I haven't actually heard. Yeah. I know like I don't, when people I talk don't about know that everybody I'm, agrees with me on that, but that's, that's my opinion. Yeah, um, I know that uh, when it comes to, to Chisau that uh, a lot of people, you know, are thinking about sensitivity as like the prime, um, what do we say, you know, the thing that they want to work on the most. But it, so it's interesting that you're talking about the structure. And I think that makes a lot of sense. I think, um, I think uh, with instruction in anything, if you've been doing something for 10 years, you've sort of internalized a lot of things and while you're teaching, you don't even think about them. It's just mm-hmm. become so automatic, you don't think to mention it. But if you just sort of, your arms are just flopping around, then you're not really doing anything useful. If your arms not in the right, if your arms aren't in the right position, then if someone's trying to hit you, um, their strike is going to be faster than your reaction. Yeah, you know, there's there's not that much you can do to increase your perceptual speed as such. Mm-hmm. From what I've read, it's more that um, you've learned learned to predict what people normally do when they're in a certain attitude or whatever. And that's why you seem to move more quickly than um, you actually are moving more quickly if you get my drift. Right? I I'm see probably what you waffling mean, yeah. a bit here and not making no, no. the points no, that yeah. I want to make. But yeah, you know, I, I strongly believe that um yeah, you have to teach people the correct structure. It's not all about sensitivity. Sensitivity is is great, but if it's not backed up with um, solid defensive structure, it's it's really not going to work for you. And obviously, jiu-jitsu is a very tactile art. Um, uh-huh. Not just your arms, but your whole body has to be yeah. sensitive. To a degree, that's true with the stance and Wing Chun as well. But, um, yeah, I think sensitivity is something that all good martial artists of all styles have. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm thinking about what you said. It's like, um, it's like when you have the structure, if your structure is really good, um, and like, uh, you know, when you're throwing hands with, uh, with an opponent, you're think you're already thinking about watching their elbows, watching their knees, those, those points of the body. And then you have your sort of gambit that you're going to throw when you see it set up, you know, like a certain way. Right. Even, like even at throw. its most, even at the most basic level, you know, the, mm-hmm. the idea of covering your center line um, gives you certain advantages. The, the person has that you're fighting has to take a longer path to hit you, um, mm-hmm. a path that's probably going to be easier for you to see. Um, it's not, not quite as simple as that. Like as any boxer will tell you, you can always beat – you can beat a curve with a straight, but you can beat a straight with a curve as well. So it's a little more complicated than that. But if you have the basic defensive structure right, then um, you've uh, you've given yourself a little bit of an advantage to just standing any old how, if you know what I mean. Right. Same with yeah. your stance. If you're if you're in a stance that you can move easily from in any direction and be mobile, you're going to have an advantage to, um, you know, a super deep horse stance or something like that, unless you've got some sort of strategy that's that's going to work for you from there. Mm-hmm. But that's what makes uh, combat so interesting, right? Because uh, you can bring anything to the table and then there's all the chaos that's involved in the ring. Yeah. 
Um, and yeah, you know, I think you've got to um, you've got to find the the middle ground that's that's or the, more to the point the yeah you eighty know, twenty rule the Pareto principle. Yeah, you know, what's what's going to work best most of the time, and stick mm-hmm. with that. And yeah, you, know, you can have um, tricks and um, tricks and surprise tactics and things around that. But if you don't have the fundamentals down, then you're probably not going to succeed, and you're probably not going to enjoy your training. Interesting. So I know that uh, you're also you're teaching in uh, there in Sydney. Yes. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Like, um, I mean, uh, are, are these these are things that uh, that you're talking with your students about? Um. Yeah. I mean, I I probably give them this big spell, you know, every couple of months or when. When a new person comes in that's sort of ready to take in this information sort of thing. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite strong on, um, defense, um, good structure. You know, structure is, if you don't have structure, you can't, um, deliver, deliver force and you can't absorb force properly. And you're probably going to find things difficult. Um, mm-hmm. And when I say that, it doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that you're rigid. It just means that you're in a good, solid defensive, um, not even solid, but a good defensive alignment that you can rapidly move, rapidly apply force, rapidly absorb force, deflect whatever you need to do. And you're probably mm-hmm. looking at a yeah basic sort of Wing Chun boxing sort of stance to do that while you're on your feet anyway. Can you tell us a little like with your students how do you um, how do you get them to to have a you know a good structure like that like what are some ways that that you guys can practice that? Um, well, good question. Um, Chase out you life any... sparring are certainly things that I would do. Um, if students are doing forms practice or whatever, um, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's good to occasionally give their uh, hands and legs a sort of light tap to make sure that, um, make sure that they're, they're in a position where they can absorb that force and not get knocked over, knocked backwards. Yeah, they mm-hmm. can recover rapidly. Um, in a lot of ways, it's easier in jiu-jitsu because you can capitalize on mistakes they make and demonstrate the outcome very easily uh, and then explain to them what you just did to them and why it worked and how they should look to stop that. Uh, you can do that with a striking art as well, but because it's so much faster, sometimes mm. it's difficult to do that, particularly in real time. So, right. uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of striking involves getting uh, tagged, which, yeah, it doesn't have to be knockout shots all the time, and it shouldn't be, but, yeah, I think, I think that's the way it's got to be. You've got to have some pressure there to um, to put the student under. It can't all be just standing around doing stuff with without any pressure. Yeah, because the physical is like the most immediate feedback that is like the most honest feedback that you can get, you know. So if you get tagged, that's, yeah. you know, that's a good teacher, you know. I, th- I think you, you definitely, particularly with striking, you have to do that progressively. Like you can't just put on gloves and go full t- contact the first day. And mm-hmm. even at advanced levels, you're doing that rarely. You're mostly working at, you know, 30 50%. The same's true about jiu-jitsu, I think. Um, you can train 100% all the time, but you will probably have a short career. Mm, yeah, you have to be careful because – 
you know, you don't want to hurt yourself and then you don't want to hurt your partner because then you won't <laughs> have anybody to practice with. Yeah, well, that's that's absolutely true as well. I mean, you know, the most important person in the room isn't you, it's your training partner because you mm -hmm. need them to be there for yeah. you. Yeah. So 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 you're you're highlighting on some of the some of the similarities when it comes to uh with the training with uh jujitsu and, and with Wing Chun. Um and so I, I'd really love to know in your in your perspective, like what are some of the ways that Wing Chun and, and Jiu Jitsu can synergize? Um you know, that or, or do they have some of the similar foundations or you know, what's your idea about that? Um to be honest with you, um, I came at jiu-jitsu with a strong Wing Chun perspective and mm -hmm. I thought, well, I've got experience in this art. Um, this will help me with the other art sort of thing because I'll be ahead of the game. But mm -hmm. And that did sort of work for me for a while, but I found that if I did too much of that, and this probably happened when I was you know, a couple of years in, uh, maybe working towards blue belt level, that um, if I tried to bring too much preconception to learning this new art, it actually sort of got in the way because mm -hmm. there are a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of differences to it. And so I just sort of... Could you, um, could you highlight some of those for us in your, in your opinion? Okay, well, you have... Um, you do have a centre line principle in Jiu Jitsu, um, same as you do in Wing Chun. Um, generally speaking, um, you want to outflank the guy and uh, get in and get him in a position where he can only use like one side of his body and you're controlling the other side. And once mm -hmm. you've sort of tied him up like that, you just hit him, whatever you want to do, right? Um, that's sort of true in jiu-jitsu and wrestling, but in a lot of ways in wrestling in particular, you're looking for inside control and you are looking to control both arms from the inside because while his arms are weapons, they're also handles for you. Mm -hmm. And um, you can actually um, you can actually do a lot more with a person's arm rather than just block it and keep it out of the way. You can actually um, use it as a handle in which to control him, take him down, uh, do whatever you want to do, and of course it's there to be attacked as well, right? Which yeah. I mean there are. There are limit attacks in Wing Chun, but uh, probably not to the same degree in, as there are in, say, Filipino styles or Jiu-Jitsu and other submission grappling styles. Right? Yeah. When you brought uh, that up, I started to think, like, you know, with Wing Chun, you're supposed to be hitting the, the person's center line. That's your – that's your you kind of – um, deal with the hands just so you can get into the body and the head. And yes, then in, in jujitsu, yeah, and in, in jujitsu, those arms are like yep. a source of uh, yep. you know of your next technique. So in jujitsu, um, you know, keeping a center line towards your opponent is important for defense, um, but you're not actually attacking the center line so much as you're attacking the extremities, mm -hmm. right? So it's, yeah, it, it is sort of different in that way. Uh, in jiu-jitsu, you absolutely have to learn to conserve your energy. You have to learn to keep yourself safe in bad positions. Um Mm -hmm. you're not letting your arms flap around because basically giving person access to your armpit just about always ends up badly. 
Um, mm. Let me see what else. Um, I did make a few notes myself here. Um, yeah, you are trying to, rather than, you know, fighting against a brick wall, you're trying to look for a door to get through or a way around the wall sort of thing oh, uh, right. all the time. Uh, you are looking to exploit what your opponent is doing rather than just, you know, crashing into them head on. Uh, of course, like in Wing Chun, that requires a fairly high level of skill to really do well. Right? Only, mm. only people that that are really, really good can really do that to to a large degree. And to most of the rest of us mortals, you know, we're sort of somewhere in the middle. <laughs> we're mm-hmm. um, yeah, we're banging up against the person and occasionally we're finding a way through that uh, isn't so difficult. I mean, that's the aim, but getting there is not as easy as some people might make it out to be. Andrew, would you say that the uh, sensitivity you developed in Wing Chun assisted your ability to transition to movements in Jiu-Jitsu in any way? Um, I think definitely to a degree. Um, the difference is that, um, you know, it's, it's mainly arm sensitivity in Wing Chun and to a lesser degree, uh, you can feel what a person is doing from your contact with them. But because Wing Chun to a large degree works in that sort of specific range, um you're not subject to the same range of variability that you are in jiu jitsu i mean in jiu jitsu um yeah you can you you actually in a lot of ways can fight just as well if not better with your eyes closed because mm-hmm. you when you're up close to someone you can't really see what's going on anyway and if you're staring them right in the face, you've got this whole emotional sort of contact with them sort of thing that actually gets in the way of thinking clearly about what you're trying to do. Um, mm. You've probably noticed yourself that um, a lot of guys, when they're doing chi sao, they'll sort of not look at the guy directly, but they'll look off to the side or look over their head or something yes. like that. And yeah. to a large degree, that's because staring directly into someone's eyes um, takes you out of the sort of um, reaction sort of thing and you start thinking about thinking more about yourself, if I know what you mean, and your mm-hmm. feelings and what's happening inside you and you really want to concentrate on what they're doing and reacting mm-hmm. to that. I don't know if they're making much sense here. A lot of other people have said it better than me. But, no, I, um, I think I understand uh, yeah. completely. Because we had the same thing. Like when we train, we focus on the center of the person or, or off to the side. And and yeah, in, in my personal experience, uh, you know, learning and then, you know, teaching others, like that's like the first thing <laughs> that you tell somebody. It's like, oh, don't look at me. Look, at, look somewhere else because, yeah. you know, you're going to mess it up. I mean, the old saying is he's not going to hit you with his eyes. Ah, there you go. You don't have to yeah. block that. So. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess in, in jiu-jitsu, um, you know, you've got sensitivity with your whole body in all sorts of um, positions and attitudes that you need. I mean, um, judo. Judo is all about sensitivity. You know, a really good judo guy can feel – the instant you start to move off balance and can capitalize on that, you know, a good wrestler can do that. Um, talk about structure in Wing Chun. You know, if you want to develop good structure, try some wrestling because you'll get instant feedback on where your, um, you know, your body linkage is deficient because you'll get driven off balance or backwards or knocked over or whatever you know Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Am I making sense here? Yeah, Is it does make sense because it's like with Wing Chun, you have sensitivity with your forearms and your things like that. But then like with something like jujitsu, it's almost like you have the, the way that you train it. It's like you have more surface area in order to experience sensitivity because you're, you're closer and well, you can really feel. Uh, abs- absolutely, you do. Um, I mean, you you have to work. You're working in a different range, essentially. You yeah. Know, similarities that I see. Um, a good sprawl, which is your takedown, def- your basic takedown defense in wrestling. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, you're basically adopting a Wing Chun stance, but you're doing it horizontally with your feet sliding out behind you. Your body Mm -hmm. sort of has to be a unit that stops them accessing your legs, but you're sort of doing that in a horizontal plane, whereas in a Wing Chun chun stance, you're in a vertical plane. Mm -hmm. Um, Conversely, you know... um, if you're in a situation with a takedown artist, you have to be very aware of, um, you know, your, the placement of your weight and that sort of thing. And, you know, your traditional Wing Chun stance, um, you know, if you don't have any takedown awareness, you're basically uh, a takedown waiting to happen in a lot of ways. And I'm not saying that it's not possible to do that. I'm not saying that, you know, Wing Chun doesn't have moves that will work on the ground or that aren't a, wouldn't be effective against grapplers or that it doesn't have some grappling moves itself. It's just that, um, you know, up against – if you do Wing Chun and you practice that stuff maybe once a month, which I think is in a lot of ways probably more than a lot of people practice it, um, against a guy that's doing takedowns and groundwork four days a week. Um, no matter how good your style is in theory, you know, the the amount of time you put into it just isn't going to cut the mustard there. So as a Wing Chun person, you've got to fight very differently to the way a grappler does. And I think Keith Kernspeck said it amongst others, you know, don't wrestle a wrestler. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to, yeah. you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to take someone on who, in the sense, in the way that they know the best. Yeah, and um, yeah, as you may have read one of my articles on my blog, uh, the way I was taught Wing Chun, there's definitely ground fighting in it, but the emphasis on the ground is very different from Jiu Jitsu. Um, mm-hmm. Most kung fu styles, not all, you don't want to go to the ground, but you need something there to defend yourself, give yourself the time and space to be able to get back to your feet and resume the fight from there. Whereas, yeah, uh, yeah jiu-jitsu, um, yeah, we're quite happy to, with one opponent, take them to the ground and stay there and gradually sort of, you know, work them into submission or unconsciousness, um, which is, yeah, both both strategies work, but, you know, don't, don't try to use Wing Chun to do what Jiu-Jitsu does and probably vice versa. You know, Wing, Wing Chun guy, you get knocked down you have ways to stand up where you're safe. You have ways to get the opponent away from you. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, you're using those. It's their emergency measures. You're getting back to your feet and you're getting back to where you're comfortable. You know, that's, gotcha. that's my opinion. I, I won't say that stuff. I won't say that stuff doesn't work. I won't say it's. It's not as good as jiu-jitsu, but it's designed for that specific strategy. You know, you go down to a ground and go down to the mm -hmm. ground and try and stay there with a jiu-jitsu guy when you don't have any. It's very unlikely to work out well for you. 
Yeah, right. You want to make it uh, back so where you have an advantage. Yes. Uh, again. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's let's kind of stay on the ground a little bit now that we're talking about you know um, how these are how these are similar. We've been talking about that, and so um, like when you teach and you're teaching Wing Chun, are there any like specific techniques that you like to to go over when it's like uh, like the Wing Chun for the ground? Um, we do have um, okay. I will say this. Um, as I said before, I don't try to blend the arts too much um, when I'm teaching because I think people get confused. And I don't think I have – I mean, I, I've not fought MMA. I trained at an MMA school and I've done some MMA classes there. I've sort of maybe – you know, halfway through the ranking system they have there in MMA, such as it is. Most people say, you know, there's no ranking in MMA, but, you know, this, you can teach it like something else. But really, you know, grappling and punching, grappling and striking together is a different thing from grappling alone and striking alone. I really think there are three completely different arts that you've got to approach differently. And, mm. you know, I, I'm not really sure I can articulate this that well, but if you just try to do, if you try to do the combination all the time, um, I think in some ways that's a recipe for mediocrity. You've got to, you sort of got to branch out and specialise in striking a bit, branch out and specialise in grappling and groundwork a bit for a time and then sort of come back and try and synthesise things again. I've always seen that um, in MMA schools, they generally will teach some sort of kickboxing and um, some sort of... Um, usually jiu-jitsu, wrestling as well. Um, the guys that specialise in jiu-jitsu, you know, they'll generally beat up on the MMA guys in pure wrestling. Um, mm -hmm. Same with kickboxers. But if you join the two together, the guys that, the guys that are training for MMA will generally prevail. But, you know, it's, it's extremely um, environment and um, arena specific in that way, right? Um, yeah. I think we got a bit off track there. What was I trying to say? What did you ask me? Uh, we would just wanted to elaborate if, like, um, you know, with Wing Chun and, and ground fighting or ground techniques, I guess I'm wondering at this point, like, which, which – Wing Chun techniques or approaches uh, translate well to the ground, if any. Okay. Um, um, I saw. I I see now how I got onto this. Um, we do have like a, um, a a practice of like break falls or engaging the ground, if you like, right. Okay. Um, and engaging the ground isn't like you falling over and slapping it as hard as you can. Um, it's basically if you're already sitting there or you know you're about to end up there because you've tripped over or something, you know, there's, there's uh, good ways to uh, land on the ground so you're not hurting yourself and there's less good ways. You know, same if you're sitting there, there's better, pro better postures to adopt and less good postures to adopt. And we sort of go through all of those to some degree, which aren't, aren't exactly rocket science. Um, same as, you know, the introductory self-defence lesson in jiu-jitsu. Um, you basically want to keep, when you're on the ground, you want to keep your legs between yourself and your opponent. Uh, you basically... Mm -hmm. um, Anything that comes in range, you kick at, which is sort of what I was talking about with the, the leading edge, etc. 
Mm-hmm. Um, right. Back in the early days of MMA, you were allowed to do what are called up kicks, which are kicking the guy from the ground. Uh, yes. You're not allowed to do that anymore because they uh, they were basically too effective and too devastating. Um, there's quite a few matches. Well, not not quite a few, but there are a few good matches uh, where you can see f- people fighting extremely effectively off the ground. There's a match, early match with Henzo Gracie and Oleg Tektarov, where Henzo mm-hmm. basically knocks him out with a head kick from the ground. Yeah, um, I was just watching that on your website, actually. Yeah. There's another match with um, a guy called Alan Goes, a Brazilian guy, um, and Kazushi Sakuraba, who um, back in his day was one of the best MMA fighters of all time. And um, Mm -hmm. Alan Goes fought him extremely effectively from the ground, mainly using kicks, etc., And those are the sort of strategies that, as a Wing Chun fighter, you want to adopt. You don't want this guy to close with you and get his hands on you. You don't want him to get close to you. You want to keep him away, find the space and time to stand up and resume the fight where you've got the tools that you need. Mm -hmm. So most of it, you know, we'll get, We'll get bags out and, you know, kicking shields and we'll get people to practice kicks from the ground. Um, there are a few sort of leg entanglements and trips you can do, which are basically like side hook and roundhouse kicks uh, while you're on the ground there, while you might be mm-hmm. able to put the guy down on his back and then either get up or, you know, close on him while he's on the ground with kicks to the head or whatever. Um, you may be able to blow out a knee or something if you're lucky, but basically mm-hmm. your strategy is keep uh, your legs between you and him and uh, do damage if you can, take advantages of any opportunity he might give you to hurt him, but basically stand up as soon as you get the chance to do so and you should be creating that opportunity by kicking his shins as hard as you can, kicking him anywhere else, he gives you the target <laughs> as well, right? Um, cool. There are other things that we'll do if they do sort of manage to get past your legs, but you're really talking about desperation stuff there. And, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if you're on your feet, the guy's already got the drop on you sort of thing. But, yeah, you can't. Jiu-Jitsu teaches you this. You have to learn to respond from the worst possible positions. You can't, (coughs) pardon me, you can't assume that um, you're always going to be able to fight where you want to be able to fight from. You've got to have, yeah, you want to be in a position where you never sort of have to give up and think, oh, I'm done. I don't have any responses from here. That's a that's an interesting take on that. So it's like if you were practicing, get in the worst position you possibly can, and and let's get out of it. Yeah, and that's that's um, that's a big thing in jiu-jitsu, and it's one of the uh, things that sort of attracted me to it. It's sort of like you know, if five five messed up totally, and this guy's sitting on top of me, um, what can I do? Sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and chances are, if he's good enough to put you on the ground and get on top of you, he's probably better than you and you're going to lose. But, um, yeah, don't give up sort of thing. What can, what can you do from here? Interesting. That's cool. Yeah. And, you know, um, jiu-jitsu has sort of taught me and I think taught most people that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, not to give up and 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 still try to yeah. to make it out. But I think yeah, you know, you've got to think strategies from there as well. You think yeah, um, this is this is this is pretty bad. But what can I still do from here? Yeah. Even if it's just avoiding damage. 
you know, what's mm-hmm. what's the best position for me to protect my head? Um, what else do I have to watch out for? What What's his next move likely to be? And either one, how can I stop him from doing that? Or two, if he tries that, how can I use that to my advantage? That sort mm-hmm. of thing. Gotcha. And, you know, as, okay. a, as a Wing Chun person, I think you can – you can use that sort of mindset, but you know it's something that you're confronted with in jiu-jitsu from day one. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I, I, I would hope that all good Wing Chun teachers, yeah, you know, will tell you that yeah, you know, you're going to end up. People are going to get the drop on you occasionally. Um, how can I protect myself? How can I minimise the damage? It's not always like, you know, this guy's going to be six feet away from me and he's going to start mouthing off and I'm going to have plenty of time to set up my guard and get in a <laughs> yeah. ready position and stuff like that. Um, and generally, you know, that sort of stuff doesn't happen. Um, it's surprise attacks. One person gets the advantage and they press it until – the other person's basically unconscious or they're pulled apart or whatever. Right. Yeah, it's like you want to make sure when you're teaching and learning, you want to make sure, take the fantasy out of it and, and put the realism in because, you know, a situation that's likely to happen, well, you know, it's going to happen. And, yeah, you need some, you need pressure and contact and that sort of stuff, which doesn't mean mm-hmm. you have to get your bell rung every time you're training, but, yeah, you know, it's got to be. Um, yeah, you you have to realise when you make mistakes and learn not to make them again. And the best way to do that is to suffer a little for your mistakes, right? Which mm-hmm. isn't to say that you should be getting injured, but you know, there's nothing that um, nothing that uh, teaches better than. Uh, Transient pain, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a oh, very good feedback. There. I'm not going to let let him hit me there again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're gonna st- we're gonna wrap up soon, but uh, I really want to ask you one question since we've been talking about MMA. Um, I know MMA is like, um, it's you know it's really popular. Uh, martial art and you know in the com- in the com- in the competitions and so I'd like to ask you you know what's your perspective when it comes to Wing Chun's place um, in a competitive sport like like MMA okay um, I trained jiu-jitsu at an MMA school um, I have friends that have uh, that have held professional title belts um, I know Elvis Sinisic and Anthony Parosh, both of whom are UFC veterans, and I trained with them for about a year. I couldn't keep doing that because of, you know, logistics, basically. Uh, and I'm much happier with my current instructor, Anthony Lange, uh, which is no reflection on them. But, um, you know, I, some of my... Wing Chun, um, Sea Hings and Sea Dives have fought kickboxing and MMA, uh, done quite well. Uh, one of my um, Sea Dives, Nick Ariel, was an IWKA K1 World Kickboxing Champion. Um, I have um, academy mates that are one of Rick's satellite academies in Tasmania that uh, they have a really good um, jiu-jitsu and MMA program. They have a few people that fight MMA and have succeeded professionally and actually both male and female athletes. Um, Mm -hmm. Basically, to succeed in MMA, you have to train like an MMA fighter. You can't do forms and chisel and dummy and Mm -hmm. expect to go into an MMA ring and do well at all. You've got to fight. You've got to train. 
uh, against people that want to take you down. You've got to train against people that want to submit you on the ground. Um, you've got to train to use the cage and not have the cage used against you, stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, that's got to become part of your program and you've almost certainly got to go outside Wing Chun to get those skills and, yeah, there's no sort of disgrace in that. Um, as I said, I've, yeah, I started in an eclectic style. I've never been a stylistic purist. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I've had experience with not deep experience, but, you know, I've tried to pick up Filipino martial arts and, um, you know, other bits and pieces, whatever, whenever it's sort of been presented to me because, I think it all has a place. Every art has something to offer. Um, and, you know, you don't know if the particular rabbit hole you're going down is necessarily the right one for you in case you, unless you stick your head out and have a look around occasionally. Um, so that would be my take. I won't say that Wing Chun can't be adapted for MMA, but... Um, the way it's taught traditionally, um, you're unlikely to do well. You've you've really got to synthesise everything else that's going on. You've got to look at modern sports science. Um, you've got to mm -hmm. look at what other fighters are doing and understand what they're doing. And you've probably got to study a bit at least of what they're studying to be able to do that. But Andrew. it can be done. People do it. Um, in terms of striking, uh, we see arts like Muay Thai and Western boxing. Um, how well do you think Wing Chun fills that fills that area in mixed martial arts in terms of striking? Um, I think you have to train. You're going to meet mostly people that box and do Muay Thai in MMA you've got to have something that works against them. You've probably got to study what they do and look at ways that your Wing Chun can work against them. My instructor, Rick Spain, um, it's not MMA, but it was kickboxing. And uh, Wing Chun's not known for high kicks, but, um, you know, in... The old days, you know, you didn't have leg kicks, though they're devastatingly effective. Um, you had to kick above the waist. And Wing Chun, that's not a forte of Wing Chun. What Rick mm -hmm. did was take Bill Wallace's kicking system and he integrated that into what he did. Um, did a fair bit of boxing training as well. Um, and he managed to integrate the Bill Wallace system in with what he does. He used to be a fabulously good kicker. Um, I was surprised that, you know, hey, this guy wants me to learn to do all these kicks and they're not Wing Chun. But if you learn to do them well, they're really effective and they make you into a better combat athlete, absolutely. You don't have to kick high, but it's better to, um, you know, have it and not need it than need it and not have it sort of thing. Right, so yeah, yeah. I think you have to be prepared to look a little outside of what you're doing, and maybe, yeah, you know, not. Yeah, you know, it's very tempting to sort of really want what you're learning from whoever you're learning from, no matter how good they are at teaching it, to be everything that you need. But it's not necessarily the case. After after a while, you're going to find things that work and don't work for you, and you've got to look at your own ways to filling those holes. I mean, I trained Wing Chun as a traditional system. Um, yeah, I was very strong on that, and um, you know, I wanted to get my forms and my chi sao and my dummy really good and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, there's so many other things out there that I found I wanted to pursue and that I found worked really well for me as well as that. And it would have been 
I think, foolish for me to ignore those and not explore them. Mm -hmm. I think I know, I know what you're saying. For me, martial arts is a personal experience. And like, I think what you alluded to before, like some things work for you, you adopt those things, other things don't, you, you kind of put them aside. Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, and a lot of very smart people have said this to me as well. Um, yeah, you know, don't don't make your training all about this fight that if if you live a good life is very unlikely to happen anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I've had very few sort of real skirmishes. Uh, I did have one at 63 in a road rage incident against a bigger, stronger guy, uh, very much younger too. And I did okay in that. I got a few cuts and bruises, but I wasn't badly injured. Um, mm -hmm. But I used, you know, I did nothing that I hadn't learned in my first six months of training. You know, mm. and I reckon that was really all that I needed. Um, but, you know, you can't sustain that for 20, 30, 40 years. You've, mm -hmm. There's got to be, there's got to be more things that interest you in there rather than, you know, worrying about self-defense and the likelihood of you being attacked all the time. And that, you know, that's no way to live your life anyway. And, you know, there's so much out there to explore. Even if you want to stick with Wing Chun and there's nothing wrong with that, the, you know, the rabbit hole runs so deep. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, it's, as you say, it's a personal journey, but don't let anyone else necessarily tell you what your journey should be or what you need to concentrate on to be a real martial artist because, yeah, that's up to you. I definitely agree with that. I, I feel that's true for me too. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah, I've talked a lot about my path and, my thoughts about things, but you know, that's, that's me. Even, yeah. you know, people I train with all the time, uh, I know think very differently to me and have different martial interests than I do. And, you know, thank God for that. The world would be pretty boring if we all thought the same. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Andrew, you, you've been a fabulous guest on, on our show today. It's, and, um we'll wrap it up here and uh it's been really nice talking to you that's great it's um i hope i've sort of given you what you wanted um sort of thing um mm -hmm. yeah i i you dragged some ideas out of me that i didn't know were there sort of thing um that's yeah, great. I, I hope I hope that um, I hope that you and your listeners um, enjoy this and get something out of it. I I yeah I'm an introvert basically, but uh, I find once I get on a roll that I really enjoy myself and I really had a good time talking to you guys. Andrew, I uh, I found everything you had to say very interesting and very unique perspective. Okay, yeah. well, thanks. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, yeah, Stay once again, in just, touch. Uh, Stay in touch. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'm not, and, I'm not uh, suggesting maybe, you have to get me on again, but, yeah, I'd like to – like to. I'm happy to talk to you guys more offline. You know, I was just thinking we have we have more that we can talk about too. There's, there's a there's – a, as you said, the rabbit hole goes deep and there's all kinds of topics and – so yeah, I'd love to have you back. That'd be great. Well, I'm not I'm not necessarily fishing for that, and you know, there's a lot of other interesting people out there that you probably <laughs> should get to before you circle back Andrew. to me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that if if you feel that's appropriate. Okay. I'm Ever sure so we humble. can think of something else to, to talk to you about. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, you guys um, take care, and uh, yeah, don't. Stay healthy, look after yourselves, social distancing and all that. It's very hard to work out what the truth is with 
current situation, but uh, well, at 65 with some older relatives, I have to err on the side of caution. I'm missing a lot of my martial arts friends, but I think it's for the best for the time being. Yeah, for the time being. Um, and for our listeners, I just want to let them know where to find you if they want to find more information about you. So I know your website is exponentialjujitsu.com. Yep. Andrew Nerlich in uh, in Sydney, Australia. That's N-E-R-L-I-C-H, Andrew. That's right. And um, yeah, thanks again. It's been it's been really nice talking with you. Okay, it's it's been a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you, Vito. Thank you, Dane. Thank you for coming on, Andrew. It's been great. Sorry. All right. And thank you for listening to today's episode of the Wing Chun Discussion Podcast. Log on to wingchundiscussion.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. More episodes are available on iTunes, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.